Aleluya. 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 Turn around and smile at or shake somebody's neck. I'm sorry. <laughs> that didn't work out at all, did it? Wonderful. Uh, you may be seated. Once you get nested, get your purses straightened out and all of that, and your wrinkles out of your skirt, figure out who's sitting around you. Let me ask you to stare at me and listen carefully. From 1990 until the end of last year, Porter and Joanne Speakman have served as our missions representatives, head of our missions department, so faithfully, so wonderfully. And I want to say that I thank them for their friendship and their leadership over the years. Since 1998, this church has given over $50 million. 50, don't, don't, 50 million dollars just to world missions that doesn't count our home missions so we've had a huge impact on the world for this last quarter of a century and I just want to say to them that I appreciate the millions of miles they've traveled and the friendships they've developed that have allowed us to go to places we could not have normally gone we're going in a different direction now pastor Tony Arnett is still the children's pastor Repeat that. He's still the children's pastor. And I promise you we'll get 100 phone calls tomorrow asking why Pony, uh, Pastor Tony is no longer the children's pastor. It's just the way it is. He's still the children's pastor uh, to elementary students. But he's also going to serve as a, a coordinator of our international efforts in missions with pastors and lay leaders. We already have eight really big and exciting missions trips planned for this year. We plan to do more than we've ever done. And uh, we want to do it not just for groups in the church, but we want families to go on missions trips together. That's the direction in which we are headed. So I want you to go on site, on site, that's not right, online to the website. See, I still don't have all this down yet. And uh, check out all of these things that we have uh, readily available for you. And we've certainly, over the years, developed some great, great relationships. I, as a matter of fact, this time next year, I'm going to be taking a trip to Israel. And if you want to go, you need to let us know at the office as soon as possible because it's going to be first come, first serve. So if you're interested in going to Israel, we're going to take a group next year. But it's not just Israel. We've got places and relationships all over the world. And today, we're very happy to have some very special guests with us. We have two representatives from With Open Eyes, which is a ministry that Jan and Frank Harrison started after their son went home to be with the Lord. He had such a passion for the African people, their son did, and they would like to continue that. And they've started With Open Eyes in fact, we're taking two trips to Kenya and Rwanda this year in just a few more uh, months. But I am happy to have four great friends here today, Ben and Christine. Would you stand with us, please, from Kenya? This is her first time ever. <laughs> Ben's been here once. Christine, this is her first time, so she's checking us all out over here in America. And my good friend, Pastor Simon and Agnes, would you stand, please? I am so happy to see them. Boy, could I tell some stories today about the fun we had in Africa and some of the danger we got in in Africa. I, I will say this. Agnes, that food in your home that day was mwah. 
I wish I had some right now. We're so happy to have them as our guests today. I want you to go with me to God's Word, and I'm, I'm just going to lay it out to you. I don't... Have you, as you read the Bible, ever noticed that God, before He promotes or moves you somewhere else, strips you? That's what amazes me about Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. And I'm drawn back again this week to Joseph and that whole beautiful story. And my grandchildren know this story about the coat of many colors. And we know that it was through Abraham that the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we know that it was through uh, Isaac, then Jacob, and his 12 sons, who would become the 12 tribes of Israel, that the nations would know of the true and living God, but nothing happened quickly, and it certainly wasn't easy. So let's start with Joseph as that little boy with that colorful coat. That's what everybody seems to remember. When I started reading that, it dawned on me again when he was in Potiphar's house. Years later, he was also wearing a coat. And then several years later, when he was in the dungeon or the prison, he was wearing another coat. And then I went back and it, I saw it. Before God moved him anywhere, he took his coat. He stripped him of the raiment he had on at that time. There is young Joseph in that coat of many colors. Can't you just see it? A spoiled brat. A, a, a really a different generation from his older brothers. And they despised him because he was treated differently. He got more things. He, he seemed to be a favorite of his father, which was readily admitted by his father. And can you see this young chap? in his youthful arrogance, talking all the time, because young people know everything. <laughs> Don't you? You're so much smarter than your parents, and you know, you just, oh, God. <laughs> Why would, what would make a guy, you know, walk around in front of his brothers whose hands are calloused and their sun dried and beaten up and they worked and shepherded what would make this soft-skinned untested flamboyant boy in his mind flaunt this coat of many colors oh he had vision god gave it to him but it was untested vision it was inexperienced vision it was a dream that he was going to carry out. And so in all of his self-will, everything was about him. All the talk. God saw it. And God said, okay, now it's time to start the process. The process of self-removal. Some of you are about to enter into a process of self-removal. I pray for you because I've been there. And I am there now. And not one bit of it is fun. Self-removal. And I want you to know any believer that's operated in self is in for trouble. You're just going to bring heartache and sorrow, and misery, and confusion, and bad decisions into your life. And so, from now on, God will have you in the process of self-removal to get you to the end of yourself. God wants self out of you. You're his child, you're blessed. Oh, but it's the arrogance of selfishness. The coat, the peacock mentality. 
Look what I have. And I have a dream. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to achieve that. So God said, this would be a great time right now to take his coat from him. Everything he's proud of and everything that makes him boast. I'm going to take it from him. And I'm going to let his family do the taking. And that's going to be more painful for him than anything else. To have his own family strip him for God. And as you know, for the rest of that time, little Joseph lived with a broken heart. His family broke his heart. Nothing was coming together. Nothing made sense. From that time forward, God's chosen person ministered with a hurting heart. God's man did God's business with a broken heart. But God was near him. Because the Bible says that God is near them that have a broken heart. And he delivers those whose spirits are crushed. And I want to say to somebody, somebody, God is probably nearer to you when your heart is broken and you can't feel a thing than he ever is when you are feeling pretty good about what's going on in your life. So here he is now, stripped of his coat, separated from his father, done wrong by his family, and he finds himself in Potiphar's house. When it first started out, he was untested. Now he's being tested. Being gone from family, probably thinking he'll never see them again, he makes a mental adjustment. Well, I'm here. I'm going to do the best I can while I'm here. While I'm here. And he prospers in a worldly and ungodly government. He adjusted to the ungodliness. He made friends with the world. He worked for the world. And I want to tell you that happens sometimes. When you get discouraged with God, what you thought he was going to do, but he hasn't done. And when you figure out that everybody in church is not saved, and even those who say they are aren't honest, well... And that Christians will do some sly things. Christians will tell half-truths if there be such a thing to get by, to get a discount. Christians are at ease with some of the most ungodly and unlawful things as anybody in the world. Christians will do about whatever it takes to make it when they are in self-will. So he did what he had to do, and God was with him. I want to tell you, whoever you are, you're discouraged with the church, you're discouraged with God, you don't know what to do next, don't make friends with the world. The easiest thing to do is say, I've had it with them, and try to make friends with the world. Listen to me. The world will eventually require you to do something that will violate your conscience. It will demand that you do something that will insult your God. And your faith will be challenged. And then everything they thought they gave you, they will feel free to take away. Is anybody listening to me this morning? God does not want you, sir, or anybody in this choir, or on this stage or on that screen, or in that building, to ever look to them 
for help. He doesn't want you looking to yourself, and he doesn't want you looking at them for answers or resources. Whosoever will be a friend of the world, James said, is the enemy of God. If you start looking to the world, the corporation, the resources of this society to get you out of trouble, you have violated faith in God. I'm just being real honest with you this morning. And God will soon strip you of your dependence on this very world. Listen, I I sat with a brother 10 days ago. I was just counting it up. And I hope he will know how much he blessed me at that dinner. He said he was doing very well in a very large city in a very large corporation. Was moving along just fine in the world. They wanted him to go out and drink after work. He said, no, I'm going home to be with my family. They wanted him to go to different places and indulge in things that worldly people (coughs) do. He's a Christian. His heart's not in that. He said, you, you guys go ahead. I'll go home or I'll work a little longer. One day he was sitting there working and his friend came to the door and said, come here. Stand up. Come here. He stood up. He said, don't touch anything on your desk. Don't even look at your computer. Don't touch a single personal item that you have. Come out from behind the desk and come with me. And when he walked to the door, there was a security guard. And the friend and the security guard walked him down to the elevator, down to the floor, ground floor, out the front of the building, on the sidewalk, and said, thank you very much. You can come and get your personal things in a few days. We will notify you. I want to tell you something. That's what you can expect from the world. Once they use you up, they will kick you out. You don't have a friend in the world. The world will make you think that they've blessed you and given you opportunities and advantages. But it's just a matter of time before you get stripped of that garment you've been wearing around in this environment. That's exactly what happened to Joseph. He was minding his own business, doing well where he was, and God said, it's time to move on. The testing needs to continue. So when Potiphar's wife asked him day after day to lie with her, this is not a new story, you know this well, And he turned her down day after day because he said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? One day she grabbed his cloak, his garment, and she stripped it from him. And he went away nearly naked, almost bare. That was God's way of saying to his man, This is not where I wanted you to stay anyway. I didn't want you to get comfortable, so I allowed her. This time, it's her. This time, it's the world. The first time, it was your family. This time, it's the world into whom you've placed your confidence. But the world cannot take care of you. The world does not care about you. So now that you're at this stage, I'm going to let her strip you of another garment. Let me tell you something. If his heart was broken when his brothers betrayed him, his heart is now sick because all hope seems to be gone. The Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Thinking he would one day see a solution to all of this confusion, and yet it never comes. And part of the testing in your life It's to think that people have forgotten you, but it's it's more than that. Your heart gets sick when you think God has forgotten you. Well, I won't get a lot of thunderous applause here this morning, but it's not time for thunder. It's time to hear from the good word of the Lord. Do you hear this preacher this morning? A sick heart is difficult to deal with. 
when you don't know why God won't help you. When every time you turn around, the hole is deeper and darker. And the people keep insulting and accusing and leaving you. You've done the best you can. You've put your resources and your best into it. And now they've turned on you. They've stripped you. You have nothing left. And once again, you're going to prison. Forgotten. Even by God. Now I want to ask you a question. If they'll throw Psalm 62 up there. This is how... David had to deal with that very thing. My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Did you notice he said, He is my expectation. I need to ask somebody a question here this morning. Who are you expecting to help you? Which group is it that's going to get you out of this mess? Which lawyer? Which doctor? Which person can hook you up with somebody? What man, what woman are you looking around for that can come and meet your need and solve your problem? You know, as a pastor, for many, many years... Having done conferences and meeting with preachers all over the place, there is one thing that is, it, it, it's, a, it's in my craw when I hear preachers say, all I need is for God to send me some people with money. We can't pay our bills. The stress of financial debt is killing us. If God would just send us some people with money. And I got preachers listening to me right now. And you've said that very thing. And you're praying for a breakthrough where suddenly successful business people are going to come into your life. And the problem with that is you're going to make friends with them. And when you make friends with them, they're going to do things for you. And when they do things for you, they're going to expect you to do something for them. And I just got through telling you, they're, they're going to make you violate your conscience. They're going to make you insult your God. They're going to test your faith. Folks, you shouldn't have an expectation from anybody except God, who is your refuge and your strength, your answer and your solution. Where is your expectation? I'm not moving on till I get an answer from somebody. Where is your expectation? Who's going to fix it for you? Is another man going to fix it for you, lady? Sir, is a woman going to fix it for you? Sir, is that businessman going to fix your life? What's, who's going to do it? I tell you the moment we start looking to people for an answer, we become a friend of the world. And you can expect God to strip you so quickly you'll spin like a top. He will not have his children depending on anybody but him. I want to say it again. God is our expectation. God is our refuge and our strength. God will not allow us to be moved. I know I'm preaching now. Because some of you are looking for somebody. You're just hoping somebody will show up. They're not going to show up. But if they do, they won't have what you need. God alone has what you need. And if you will wait on God, God will not disappoint you. Hallelujah. Of all people in the world, preachers ought to know that people can't solve our problems. God is our source. God is our solution. Well, that's the testing that Joseph went through. Twice he's been stripped by his family and by the world. Now he's sitting in prison, tested. You got to see this. Genesis 41, 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him what? 
Come on, church, you can do better than that. They brought him out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. I was blown away last night as I was just, honestly, I was messing around with Scripture. Just going from here to there, you know, no intense or even focused study, just and I said hastily, and that was in the old King James. I don't know what I was doing with an old King James Bible. And I thought, I wonder what that meant. Hastily. I went and did a little Hebrew word study. You know what it means? They made him run. They came from Pharaoh's palace and made him run. There was no beating around the bush. I think it's amazing that his family stripped him the first time. The world stripped him the second time, but he stripped himself the third time. He, cl he changed his own clothes. He said, I need to get rid of some things in my life. I cannot stand before Pharaoh smelling like this. I will not go in front of Pharaoh unclean. I don't know what's about to happen. But the Bible says he changed his raiment. I want you to know that when it's time for you to do what God designed for you to do, you can't shuffle around and drag around. When God summons you, he's going to make you run. So it's time to strip. It's time to put off the old man and put on the new man. It's it's time to lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us and let us run. There it is again. Set it aside and run. Now that Joseph has been tested, it's time for God to put him where he designed him to be. And it happened so quickly that Joseph's head spun. Can you see all those Attendants and soldiers coming down to that prison and Joseph hears the gate rattle and he hears the, 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 the people making noises and mumbling and there's a, a crack of a whip and a soldier demands immediate withdrawal and they open it said hurry up right now we're running to Pharaoh's palace and, and all of a sudden he had to strip himself of the old stuff and put on some fresh stuff. Because God, in just a few minutes, would run him into Pharaoh's palace. And the coat of many colors would be a distant memory. And Potiphar's wife would be a distant memory. Now he understands why he lost his coat two times. Now he understands why he had to spend time alone. God had to change his love, change his heart, change his mind, so that all of his expectation was in the Lord and suddenly, oh, I love this. The Bible says Pharaoh himself took fine linen and draped it over Joseph's shoulders. And he is now covered in the finest clothing that could be made by human hands. Let me tell you something. The world can strip you of what it's made. But when God clothes you in his righteousness... When he puts on fine righteous linens over your garment of praise, there's not a man born that can take it away from you. Once God has tested you and God has promoted you, once you understand this is why I was born and you're looking to God alone, everything else makes sense in your life. Stand up with me, please. Father, that word hastily is ringing in my ears, hastily. Oh God, help everybody in here today to realize we still have some things on us. We're still clothed in stuff that we need to strip. Because soon you are about to move in our hearts 
in our homes, in our lives. I know no other prayer to pray except, please God, help me to put my eyes on you. Help all of my expectation to be in you. I want to give an altar call, uh, altar call quickly as I can. If there's anybody here, there, or out there that feels like just being stripped everywhere you turn and you don't know what to do, God just told you today what to do. Put your eyes on Him. He's not going to let go of you. He just wants you out of you. That was so good right there. If anybody else here wants you out of you so that you can see the Lord at work, come down here and join me while we sing. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Just come on down here. In the morning when I rise, in the morning, in the morning, It's all right. I know what it is to minister with a hurt heart, with a broken heart, with a sick heart. Sick. I know what it is to wonder when. And God won't let you stop ministering even when you're hurting. And I know what it is to be stripped nothing left almost standing naked embarrassed don't have anything left but God has another garment waiting on you if you will continue to praise him and, and when, he, when you feel like things are being taken from you instead of panicking thank you Jesus that you are preparing me hallelujah that you are preparing me for more than I can possibly imagine. You're blessed in the name of Jesus. You're blessed in the name of Jesus. I, I shouldn't, I should quit right now. I found an old, old, old book in my library the other day. And you know, on old, old books, like they do today, they will advertise other books that the author has written. And one of the other books he had written was called How to Pray Victoriously. And I thought, wait, that, that, does, uh, that does not ring true with me. 
Every prayer you pray is a victorious prayer. Even if you're whining and hurting and crying because you've come to him who can dry up your tears, who understands what you're going through. If you can say, Jesus, help me, that's victorious praying right there. And I'm telling you now before I release you, the fact that you walk down here or the fact that you can say, Jesus, gives you victory in your life. And let me tell you something. You don't want to spend the rest of your life walking around like a peacock. And you don't want to spend the rest of your life serving Potiphar or his wife. No, God's got something bigger and higher and grander than that. If you just let him do the wardrobe change and you do the praising, you'll be amazed at what you see the next time you look in the mirror. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, strength and my redeemer. Amen. Bless you.